Well, the original Golden Globe race came about because um, Francis Chichester had sailed around the world with one stop in Australia. And I wasn't alone in saying, wait a minute, there's one thing left to be done. And that's to go solo non-stop around the world. And the Sunday Times were approached by my agent, but uh, decided that I didn't know what I was doing, which was a serious error on their part. Then discovered other people were doing it and decided they'd be much better off organizing a race. So they announced it in March 68 and just announced we were in the race with four of us at the time. Um, never actually entered, but... Uh, so I was planning on going in June, beginning of June. The Sunday Times then announced it would start at the end of October. And I said, well, I'm going beginning of June because I need to be around Cape Horn in midsummer down there, not in autumn. And John Ridgeway and Che Bly took the same view as me. And others took the view that we'd better go earlier. Sunday Times basically had the wrong advisors. Um, they brought Chichester and NATO as their race chairman, but it was too late. They'd already made a load of decisions based on the wrong information. And eventually nine people set out, but only three got beyond the Atlantic. Che got just beyond the Atlantic, pulled into East London or Port Elizabeth. Uh, but um, Zeni, myself, uh, Nigel Tetley and Bernard Matisse who got beyond uh, the bottom of the Atlantic. All the rest pulled out into Cape Town or earlier. So that was it really. It's, um, the mistake they made was not realizing how experienced I was. But I was a merchant Navy officer, you see, and at that time that wasn't considered, you know, what do they know about yachting? The fact that we had to learn to sail was not considered. The fact that I built my boat in India and sailed it home wasn't considered. The fact that I'm already a master mariner and therefore navigation is like having scrambled eggs for breakfast wasn't considered. So they very underestimated me. Only two of us had done really long voyages, myself and Matessio. So we knew roughly what we were taking on. We had some awareness of what it could be like. I'd been in the Southern Ocean before, as had he. None of the others had. And so I think they went with more hope than anything else. Whereas at least Matessi and I had some idea what it might be like down there. And uh, I think it's fair to say we weren't disappointed. Well, the Southern Ocean is the only uh, stretch of water in the world which has no land blocking it. Rolls on and on and on. It's constricted at Cape Horn down to about 600 miles, but that's all. The result is that the waves can really, there's nothing to stop them growing. Well, there are sort of physical limits, but when you say, look, the 30 meter wave is not unusual, um, depressions forming at about 50 south, uh, normally coming from the southwest, will. Um, deepen and create really quite appalling conditions. I mean, you're looking at a 30 foot wave from horizon to horizon and the top is breaking. That's a very dangerous situation. And uh, that's when an awful lot of boats run down the front. And of course they do steerage. And so they'll swing round in front of the wave, which then just rolls them over, as happened in the 50th anniversary race to four people. Um, one was pitch pulled by that wave. So it really is not a very nice place at all. It's miserable, cold, big waves, and just a series of depressions coming through. I think I had six in 10 days. It's not very pleasant. If you look at the number of people who sail single hand around the world, non-stop, probably about 80. Total number, 230, 240. And you compare that with over 600 gone into space. You do realize that perhaps sailing around the world is a little bit tougher. And compare it with climbing Mount Everest, of course, the figures are even greater. 
know, huge numbers uh, to climb Mount Everest, and of course, huge um, fatalities too. It's rather hard to be specific about low points. I mean, the low points when you're worrying about the boat, and that's probably your lowest point. There's low points when you just get up and say, I don't feel like doing this today. And you just have to live through the day and wait for tomorrow when you'll feel better. But I think probably halfway between Africa and Australia and around to really bad weather. And the boat wasn't comfortable. She was getting thrown around a lot. And I was very concerned she'd survive it, to be honest. Um, I thought the waves are hitting her like someone swinging an anvil against the hull. And I thought she won't take much more of this. Um, and then I thought about putting some warps out the back. I must have read about that or something. I mean, I knew it from lifeboats on ships. So this was something similar. And I did it and she just swung round became perfectly comfortable. So it was prior to getting the warp out, it was bad. And it was a low point because I was 15, 1600 miles from land. She broke up, it was a long way to drift in a life raft. I didn't think I'd win, looking at the other boats, the bigger boats than mine, and some specially built. Whereas the boat I had was one I built in India and sailed home. She wasn't built for this, for racing. But I thought my advantages would outweigh that, and that was I knew that boat inside out and back to front. And I could probably slug it out, whereas they might be inclined to pull out. And so I thought, well, in theory I shouldn't win this, but you know, it's, Theory is quite often a disproven. So I went for it. You know, I kept that boat moving as best I could all the way. Not easy to push her hard. She doesn't go fast. I mean, five knots is the absolute maximum you'll get out of it. Well, occasionally you'll go down a wave and a surf a bit more, but you won't get much more speed out of it. And so, really, it was a question of just keep plugging along. We were saying, right. You know, this is pretty miserable. The others won't like it. Good, they're more likely to pull out. If you look back 50 years, you'll realize that the, the risks we were taking were huge and there were no checks on it. Uh, so for instance, Crowhurst could sail with very limited experience, with a boat that wasn't suitable and wasn't ready. That wouldn't happen today and that is sensible. You know, you have to qualify before you can do one of these races. I approve of that. What I don't approve of is the ludicrous um, emphasis on removing all risk. And some of it's incredibly stupid. I was doing the route to Rum a few years, about five years ago, and the French scrutineer demanded to know why I hadn't got horseshoe life rings on the boat. And I said, well, it's a single-handed race. Who's going to throw them? We said, but you must have them. It was just stupid. I mean, why, why are you doing that? Um, and I'm afraid bureaucracy gets involved and comes up with stupid rules like that, which normally aren't made by the sailors. You find sailors tend to be practical about these things, saying, that's a sensible risk. This isn't a sensible risk. If you look at... Um, some of the marine accident investigation branch reports into leisure sailing, it is quite clear they haven't got experience of yachting or ocean-going yachting, and it shows up in their reports. Um, so therefore, they, they criticise because they don't understand. And at the end of the day, you think, well, actually, everyone wants us to wrap ourselves in cotton wool. Um, pop ourselves down in front of a television and watch silly games, you know, where people show little intelligence for some presenter who fancies himself asking him silly questions. And you just can't, you know, can't bear it, frankly. Risk is part of what we humans do. It's calculating those risks. You know, for instance, if I decide I'm going to fly off a eight-storey building and just throw myself off, 
That's pretty stupid. If I decide I'm going to abseil down that eight uh, story building and I've worked out how to abseil, that's a calculated risk. Probably most mountaineers will say it isn't a risk. That's their daily bread and butter. For me, it would be slightly more of a risk. Though I've done it, you know, I'm not that familiar with it. So I think if we don't have risk, we lose something that's fundamental to us as humans. And I'm afraid governments, bureaucrats, civil servants are risk averse. Drags the country backwards, drags the country down. But the worst part of it is it stops young people from learning. You know, if you say, well, you mustn't climb trees, you might fall out and break your leg. You might. But then, if you fall out of a lower branch, you realise, actually, that hurts. Don't fall out of a lower branch. You know, should we play with cricket balls? They're dangerous, they're hard. But if we don't use balls with young people, they don't get their hand-eye coordination, which is fundamental to us. So you, some risks are essential to develop us as people. And in some people, those additional risks are also essential, more so than to others. Some people would never take a risk. Others can't live without them. And generally speaking, people who want to sail around the world, apart from the few who think it's going to be easy and then realise it isn't and pull out wisely, most of us are people who like to take a risk. Somewhere out there is a wave that will get you. Um, should I therefore never go sailing? If I never go sailing, why do I have boats? Um, better depopulate Britain anyway because it's an island. We can't feed ourselves without ships. So, um, you know, it, it's. You accept that our big waves, you will at times get into trouble. I've been dismasted mid Atlantic. Um, had to sort the mess out, sail on the jury rig to the Azores. Um, you know, these things happen. But does it mean you stop sailing? No, it doesn't at all. You know, there are things, that, of course, there are things you regret in life. Um, things you know, I could have done that, I wish I'd done that. But at the same time, you know, when that opportunity occurred to do a non-stop circumnavigation solo. I didn't hesitate. I was going for that. I felt I'm 29, I'm very experienced. This is something I can do, I'm fit. This is something I can do. If I don't do it, I'll never forgive myself. So I went for it. I think if I saw something that excited me as much as that again today. I do exactly the same, but I haven't found it.